Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Abbas Milani. Uh, welcome to our uh, uh, event tonight. Uh, I want to offer a special uh, welcome uh, to Professor Stranach, who has come from Berkeley, is one of the luminaries of Iranian studies, who is a giant, is a giant uh, in the field. And uh, I'm, we are very, very grateful that he graced us with his company. So welcome, Professor Stranach. Um, before I say a few words about uh, our event tonight and our speaker tonight, I want to make a couple of announcements. We have uh, uh, three and a half other events coming up. Uh, and i tell you why it's three and a half. Uh, we have uh, next week uh, Majid Roshangar, who's going to talk about uh, uh, lit literature of diaspora and literature of migration. Some of you would know Roshangar. He has been in publishing business from Iran and now has been publishing a very sustained uh, review of books in uh, diaspora for almost 30 years. He's Tenacity is remarkable, and he has access to a lot of the diaspora literature. Is going to talk about the Iranian diaspora. The week after that, uh, Kamran Talatuf is going to talk about uh, Iranian women's best-selling novels, *The Republic of Imagination*. This is based on a book that he's uh, written. Uh, the week after that, uh, we have uh, Hushang Shahabi. If you have never heard Hushang speak, I strongly suggest you come. He is a very, very versatile, wonderful, erudite scholar, uh, multifaceted. He's going to talk about Iran and South Africa. Uh, uh, one time he came and talked about rice cooking in Iran. One time he came and talked about the Lebanese clerics who came from Lebanon to Iran. And now he's going to talk about South Africa. And in each case, it was extremely, extremely both erudite and enjoyable. Uh, I think we're going to have to cancel our last event because of Donald Trump. Uh, the last event we had was March 14th, uh, and it, is, uh, it was to be a poetry reading and a discussion with Yadullah Royayi, uh, who some of you would know is uh, one of the more eminent uh, elder uh, poets of modern Iran. He's coming from Paris, and although he has a, a French passport, because he is a dual citizen, uh, he apparently thinks, uh, we are not sure, nobody is sure whether he needs a visa or not, so we have to cancel his uh, event. We're going to try to reschedule it for fall, uh, and it is the first casualty of this madness that is now in uh, existing about the uh, and uh, the visa situation. Uh, we're going to try to have uh, another event in its place. We will let you know. If you're not on our waiting list, you can sign up and we'll send you our uh, announcements. Uh, uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker tonight, uh, although for I, I know almost everybody who is here, uh, he needs no introduction. Uh, he's the Masih Chair of Iranian Studies uh, at the uh, University of Irvine, California, which is where our very capable program manager did her undergraduate study. Uh, and uh, we are very fortunate to have uh, Ms. Parhad with us. This is where she began to study Iran and then went to NYU. Uh, and uh, those of us who have been following uh, the UC Irvine Iranian Center, the Jordan Center for Iranian Studies, uh, and have been interested in its development, I think are all awed by how much work Turaj has done in invigorating it, in bringing it into uh, the 21st century and beyond, uh, and in uh, uh, publishing a series of books, a very fascinating series of books, uh, he now has uh, the person we had here last uh, time we had an event here, Professor Zarin Kelk. He has uh, him visiting there as a visiting uh, artist. So uh, uh, he's done a remarkable work at the center, at UC Irvine Center, uh, and he's also a remarkable scholar. I think those of us who are interested in Iranian history, particularly ancient Iranian history, think that every time uh, someone like Professor Stronach or someone like Yarshater retires, uh, who is going to fill in their shoes? Who is going to fill in this great need to learn about 
uh, ancient Persia. We often despair. We often think that uh, there's a dwindling number of these people who are going to do great work. But there always is someone who surprises all of us, some ones who surprise all of us. And I think everyone agrees, everyone who is interested in ancient Iranian history agrees uh, that Turaji Daryoi is one of those remarkable, wonderful surprises. He has come and <coughs> brought much of interest to the field. Uh, he is now one of the world's top scholars of Sasanid Iran and of Iranian history, ancient of Iranian history, Zoroastrian. So it is uh, both for our program and for me personally a great privilege and pleasure to welcome to Raja Daria. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here at uh, Stanford. Uh, I thank uh, Dr. Milani for uh, being gracious and in that introduction, which uh, I thank her as well as Mr. Franco, who has been after me for months to get information out of me, so I'm able to finally uh, come here. Uh, and uh, having uh, given this introduction, I'm in no way, shape, or form anywhere close or will be close to Professor Stranak and people who have been actually uh, doing this uh, for many decades. So it's a s special honor to just uh, have Professor Stranak come to uh, my talk as he does almost every time. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much, and thank you for coming tonight. So um, let's see. Uh, the talk tonight is entitled The Idea of Iran Shah and Its Cultural Heritage. Uh, the reason uh, that I am uh, dealing with this uh, topic is that when I was much younger, I edited a Middle Persian text, it was about 2002 that was published, called Shahrestani Hai Iran Shah. Many of you may have uh, read it, seen it. And uh, I ended up doing a commentary to publish it, and it sort of gave me an idea of how these people uh, in the 9th, 10th centuries, uh, Zoroastrian priests sitting probably in Baghdad, uh, are reimagining and looking at this geography. Uh, and calling it Iran Shah at a time that the caliphs were in power and uh, had brought an alternative, not a nice word that we are using nowadays, an alternative worldview uh, and ideas not only about the past but the present. And most recently, not to just advertise for my book, uh, with my colleague Khoda Dadar Zakhani, we did a short book from Oxus to Euphrates, The World of Late Antique Iran where we set out to discuss this world of late ancient Iran in the context of uh, the field of late antiquity, a burgeoning field, an upcoming field that's very much now of interest in many universities. And our idea is by putting Iran in dialogue with other civilizations and into this uh, field, uh, it will invigorate it, it will make it much more matter uh, beyond uh, the sole idea of Iranian studies, which many of us are engaged and have spent our time. That is to step out and try to put this civilization in dialogue uh, with the Roman and other uh, late antique civilizations. And so what I want to do today is to I'll go through the book for you and sort of give you some, some ideas of what is this Iran Shah, and many of you may know already, uh, but at least to my mind, I think it's an um, idea that is quite interesting and it resonates and it lives beyond uh, the Sasanian world. And I think in many ways today when we talk about Iran as a modern nation state and the idea of Iran, it is something that is very much related uh, to uh, what the Sasanians uh, create in the third century. Uh, 
in the late 20th century, uh, the late Gerardo Nioli wrote a very fascinating book called uh, The Idea of Iran, an essay in Origins, where he challenged uh, certain notions about Iran and the term Iran as a term that is used for a political boundary, where we thought uh, there was indeed already in the Achaemenid period, uh, there was an uh, Iranian, an empire called Iranian Empire. I think Herzfeld had suggested that there was a uh, reconstruction of a word somewhere that he had seen, an Aryanam Cheshatram, uh, the, uh, the kingdom of the Iranians, where in fact it did not exist. And now we know it did not. And in fact, the f he has shown that the first time uh, that we find the name of Iran, or Iran Shah, the realm of Iranians, um, mentioned for any political boundary begins in the third century. Now, the idea of how it came about is a complicated idea that needs discussion and further research, and that is not my discussion today. But rather, uh, to begin uh, to discuss what did Iran Shah mean, and this, I think, is a political pro program uh, that the Sasanians construct uh, based on knowledge and religious learning uh, and the province of Pars to create this idea of Iran Shah with a set of cultural values and ideas that very much resonated with people in time and has stayed with us to some extent. So I'll start with this uh, relatively well-known rock relief in Nashar Rostam of uh, are the Shir on the left, the founder of the Sasanian Empire, and on the right, Urmazd, which I would call the super deity of Zoroastrianism, uh, where Urmazd is holding a barsom and uh, giving the diadem of rulership to Ardashir. Now, I can't move very much, uh, but I don't know if I can show it here or not. Let's see, does it show? Right here, on the breast of the horse, if you take a very close picture, you find a trilingual inscription. Uh, for me right now, what is interesting is the hierarchy of the, the languages here mentioned. First in Parthian, then in Greek, and then in Middle Persian. Quite fascinating of an empire that has come to power uh, in the province of Fars. It chooses to have Parthian first, and this is the language of the former empire, so it was the official language. Greek, probably the lingua franca of the Near East and sort of Mediterranean world, and then Middle Persian. Uh, I see some ambivalence of not knowing uh, which language should be really the dominant language yet. Start off with the, starting off with the empire, and you find that with Shapur as well uh, early on, where again there is this very fascinating Parthian, Greek, and even the Middle Persian is um, is on the side. So the inscription reads, which I can't read here. Uh, Roma, can I see it on here as well, or? Uh, does the time has to go because I can't read from here and I can't move from here. Yes, thank you so much. Would that work? No, it doesn't work. Okay, that's fine. That's okay. Okay, so <clears throat> let's see. Uh, so, uh, the inscription basically says, this is the image of the Mazda worshipping lord, Ardashir, king of king of the Iranians, Iran, here in the meaning of Iranians, whose lineage is from the gods, son of the lord, King Pompak. Uh, and so here we have the first time this uh, notion in Middle Persian of uh, people, Iranians. No mention of Iran Shah, yet. Uh, but soon enough, uh, with the inscription of his son, Shapur, at Kabe uh, Zartosht, and here's a nice coin of uh, Shapur, and these coins early on are very much, of course, uh, instructive of what this uh, empire uh, holds dear or is, is important for, right? The sacred fire on the reverse, and the first word on the coin says Mazdis, that you find on the inscriptions, Mazda worshippers. They're clearly telling us first and foremost there are Zoroastrians, or the Mazda worshippers. Uh, and that is the most important thing. And then uh, in this inscription, uh, in the genealogical retelling of uh, this empire, uh, we find uh, it reads, I, the Mazda worshipping Lord Shapur, king of kings of the Iranians, and non-Iranians, so this is a new element. 
whose lineage is from the gods, son of Mazda, worshipping Lord Ardashir, king of king of Iranians, whose lineage is from the gods, and then grandson of King Popak. And you can see that two former kings are king of kings, so they are actually holding an empire, while the first king, Popak, the father, was just a local king, that's why he's not king of kings. But more importantly, I'm ruler of Iran Shah. And this is the first time that we come across this term in uh, at least historical documents in Iran. Uh, or uh, an inscription. And he goes on to tell what this land of Iranians and non-Iranians is. So he gives us a long list. It's a laundry list of many provinces uh, that uh, leaves you uh, asking, well, what is Iran and what is non-Iran? And the reason for it, uh, this that he has been able to conquer territories in Syria uh, and further afield uh, fighting the Romans, having gained victory against uh, three of these Roman uh, emperors. And so this is a kind of a wishful map, almost, but uh, approximate of what he's talking about, excluding that city of Bukhara and Samarkand up there, which is uh, probably uh, not, it shouldn't be really here as a firm of control. But this is the areas that you can see in gray that is mentioned in this description. So, but it doesn't tell us what Iran is. It says these are the, um, the ruler of Iranians and non-Iranians. So in order to find out if there is a conceptual idea of a land, rather than just an idea, uh, we can go uh, to our famous Zoroastrian priest in the third century, who ends up getting a lot of flack, which I don't know why, uh, basically doing his job in the third century, Kerdir, where he points out that he went along with these early kings throughout the empire and beyond the empire into the non-Iranian territory, established fire temples, instructed priests on how to behave, how to teach, uh, conducted many marriages, and so on. And he ends up telling us what area is Iran. And so this is a Zoroastrian concept in the third century of what Iran as a political uh, sort of territory means. And he mentions parts, parts, Yahuzestan, Mishan, Asuristan, Nochiragan, Adurbadagan, Spahan, Rai, Kerman, Sistan, Gorgan, Marj, Harib, which is Herat, Afshah, Makran, and the Kushan country all the, all the way to Peshawar. And so, again, interesting enough, we look at this map, uh, Caucasus is not part of Iran, according to this priest. Uh, and Arabia is not part of this territory, but pretty much what is modern day Iraq, uh, the Iranian plateau, Afghanistan, parts of Central Asia, uh, all the way to the Oxus, and all the way close to the Indus, is the territory that the Zoroastrians within this empire, and probably then the imperial apparatus, thought was the territory. So there's a very clear conceptual idea of a territory of what this Iran Shah is. Uh, uh, there's often discussion among modern historians, which I know not much about the idea of nationalism and the ways to think of Iran. And Iranians, of course, usually come back and say, well, Iran has always been there. Uh, as an idea or in sort of literature or in sacred texts, uh, I would contend that at least in the third century, we have a firm idea of a territory, of a demarcated territory uh, of what Iran is. Now, this doesn't stay uh, constant. In the late Sasanian period, you have, again, a another view of uh, what this Sasanian world or this empire of Iran is, much larger. It's an imperialistic notions uh, that is probably from the seventh century as a result of Khosro Parviz's conquests of the Near East. Now, uh, if I said uh, the map or the inscription that Shapur was discussing that went all the way from Oxus to uh, what is modern day Iraq, this idea uh, had lived on all the way into this early Islamic period. Muqaddame uh, Shahname Abu Mansuri, the preface to the old Shahname still survives with us, but the text itself is, prose doesn't uh, survive. Uh, but we know in the prose already the same idea is echoed. And uh, it says the boundaries of Iran Shah is from Oxus to Euphrates and talks about these other realms and climes and so on, that even in the 10th century, uh, 800 years after uh, this empire begins this program and creates this 
me, uh, sort of imagery of from Oxus to Euphrates, Iran, Shah, still in literary tradition of in Persian, that very much survives. And it's one of the consequences of the Sasanian political pro program of Iran, Shah. And I think that is uh, noteworthy. But who is part of this territory? Are the Christians, Jews, Manichaeans, Buddhists, are they part of this territory? So this idea of almost like citizenship, who is part of it? And these are ideas that I think uh, are instructive for our sort of modern day of how ancient empires dealt with their population. And if they dealt awkwardly, they would have not such good results. Uh, but to be inclusive seems to have been uh, the way to bring um, calm and prosperity. So again, uh, from the coin of uh, Ardashir, we have no doubt that the, these are Zoroastrians who have created this idea of an Iran, or Iran Shah, and uh, they should have the upper hand. And in fact, if you look at the Zoroastrian uh, Middle Persian texts, in terms of terminology, of course, you have uh, Dine Rasti and Dine Ve, uh, referring certainly to Zoroastrians, and they're not talking about any other religion. Uh, but more importantly, very interesting ideas such as Marde Ere Hudin, uh, an Iranian man of good religion. I would say, hypothetically, does this mean that there could be an Iranian man of bad religion? Perhaps. I think it's too early in the third century to pose that question and find an answer, but certainly for the Zoroastrian tradition, the Iranians are of the good religion and they're Iranians, okay? And that is what is presented. Now, in the fourth century, because of uh, Iran's neighbor, that is the Eastern Roman Empire, Constantine, uh, invoking itself as the protectorate of all Christians throughout the Oikumene, the known world, uh, creates uh, this, I think, uh, discussion of are Christians Iranians or not? Are they part of this empire or not? Uh, it is a, a difficult time for Christians in the fourth century. We should remember that um, most probably of the Christian martyrologies probably are for, from the fourth century when uh, Shapur has to deal with the, the Christians within their empire, where you have an emperor just next door, you're full saying, I am the protector of all the um, Christians. And hence, Christians' uh, position is quite precarious. Uh, Manichaeans already have sort of fallen aside. They are not to be uh, included, I think, mentally as part of this empire, already in the uh, third century. But the Christians are having uh, issues here. And the question is, what to do with the non-Zoroastrians? Well, uh, this problem is going to get solved uh, by the end of the fourth, beginning of the fifth century. Whereas decided, uh, at least during the rule of this king, Yazgir I, who takes this very interesting title, Ram Shah, one who brings peace to the realm, uh, to allow Christians uh, to function in many ways as the Zoroastrians do, uh, to have a Catholicos, uh, to be residing at Ketizaphon, and in fact, the creation of a Persian Christian church, the Syriac or the Nestorian church, uh, which uh, you, should, you could say uh, distances itself uh, from the Roman Empire. Uh, so it's mainly political. It seems to be not certainly religious that the idea of being Iranian or non-Iranian is at stake, but rather loyalty to the empire and to the king. And this Yazgird first is quite an interesting character, not only for Christianity, but Judaism, and the thriving of these religions uh, in the Sasanian Empire. We know that in late antiquity, uh, people at least grouped themselves according to re their religious communities. You had the Jews, whose leader, the Resh Galut, leader in exile, uh, was the leader of the Jews. We know that they had their own prisons, uh, we have actually very detailed information, and luckily the Talmud, the important text, is composed during the Sasanian Empire. And then the Christians, you have two kinds of them, the, Chris, the Christaya in sort of Syriac parlance, the Christians in the West, and the Nasraya, the Nestorians, who are the ones in the East, uh, are in existence, according, as well as the Manichaeans, Zoroastrians, Buddhists as well. And uh, Jewish life in the Near East, of course, is something that uh, precedes the Sasanian Empire. This is sort of a nice map of sort of Jewish centers in the Middle East, 
Uh, and uh, we see that in Iran, there, indeed, there is a number of places uh, that there's evidence for early uh, Jewish life. Uh, a nice sort of uh, reference that Huna ben Nathan, one of the important uh, rabbis, had said to Yazgir to adjust his undergarment. Now, this may mean nothing uh, by itself, but what it means is it shows that the leader of the Jewish uh, community, the Rosh Galut, had access to the imperial court and was close enough, so close enough to be able to tell him that, you know, adjust your undergarment or my bow tie, you know. Uh, that it doesn't come from someone who's completely alien and uh, shows this close uh, contact. Now, a book has just been published by uh, Jason Zion Mokhtarian, Rabbi, Sorcerers, Kings, and Priests, The Culture of the Talmud in Ancient Iran, which is quite a fascinating book discussing this close contact and what can be gained by reading the Talmud about the Sasanian world and how the Sasanian world can actually contextualize uh, sort of the Jewish life in late antiquity. So I would suggest if you're interested uh, to see that and see this close, interesting relations. And we know of a number of places where the Jews were active or, uh, in terms of uh, life. Uh, Esfahan, Hamadan, Katizafan, Susa, Boucher, Mes and uh, of course in Mesopotamia, uh, where according to uh, Middle Persian sources, they owned slaves, they worked the land. Uh, there are many cases that are brought to court in the 6th, 7th century in the Sasanian Empire where people working on the land uh, in Mesopotamia, they have, their master is Jewish, they say, okay, we converted to Zoroastrianism. Could we please not be freed for the deeds of manumission that they want from the state? And the state is in a sort of a difficult bind of what to do with these people. And at the same time, we have Jewish sources where Zoroastrians go to the Jews and say, okay, we want to become Jews. And can we study the religion? Well, you have to learn. And some of them are not so bright. And you know, the Jews just give up and say, okay, this rabbi says, these are not the people we want to um, um, actually have into our religion. So there's quite a bit of this sort of crisscrossing. Okay, uh, I wouldn't say this may be in a Zoroastrian gathering, but in general, there's lots of conversions from one religion to another one in late antiquity. And we have textual evidence for it. Uh, but more interesting about our Yazgirt is it goes back to this Middle Persian text, Shahrestan Ha Iran Shah, which is so little you probably can't read in the back, which I translated, which goes back to this character. Um, uh, the, this passage in the text says, the city of Susa and Shushtar, Shushan Shushtar, were built by Shishindocht, the wife of Yazdgird, the son of Shapur, since he was the daughter of Reshkalut. So we know ya one of Yazgird's wives was Jewish, and she was the daughter of the leading exile, the king of the Jews, and also was the mother of Bahramagur. And so it's interesting if we were to imagine our very famous uh, Persian ruler who's, who lives beyond the Sasanian Empire. This is not like most Sasanian kings who die with the empire in terms of their vita and life career, be it from uh, Nizami's half Kar to art, uh, uh, medieval art, literature, as well as uh, uh, silver uh, dishes in the Sasanian, but also in the Islamic period, all the way to the modern Republic of Azerbaijan, which have fountains of Bahram Agur. It, it's a living character. It's very interesting and an evolving character. Uh, uh, it's important to know that the mother is Jewish. And probably for the Jewish community within Iran, he may have been seen as a Jewish king. Now, this is a, not an uncommon way of solidifying communities with the imperial order, okay? But it is certainly an interesting one uh, to have of the Siran Shah. Uh, about 40 years ago, if uh, you read the literature, it was suggested that the Jews had very little contact with others uh, living in the community. That is, they had their own quarter, the same as Fahan, Yahudiyah, what the Islamic sources tell us. Uh, but now we can tell that no, in fact, there was very much contact, not only at the top, but among the populace. Uh, Shaul Shaka at the University of Jerusalem, along with uh, Mr. Nave, have published a number of now volumes of these Aramaic bowls. They're very interesting bowls. You mainly find it in Mesopotamia, but other places as well, uh, where there are spells that you put, uh, that you would put under your door in the house or put it into the wall. 
okay, these are spells, these are sort of wishes to keep evil away, to, you know, and so on. And what you find is most often uh, Jews are writing these spells and Zoroastrians are going because they uh, invoke the name of uh, Ormast or Meh. Uh, or sometimes a Christian, they invoke the name of Jesus. Uh, and it's a very interesting sort of, inter it shows this interaction on the popular level. And that's how we can kind of gain a popular religion and also interaction among people. So again, from the top and the bottom, there seems to be contact. If we just want to know about Jewish life, we can look at some of the seals from the Sasanian period uh, depicting biblical scenes. And this is one of them, or two. Uh, here's another one. So um, the Jews in some way were connected to the court and were recognized, certainly. And I would suggest that they were part of the Seyon. Uh, how about the Christians? Well, already from the Arsacid period, Christians had been fleeing the Roman world in some numbers, coming to Mesopotamia and the Iranian plateau because of Roman persecutions. And so Syria, Mesopotamia, and Iran was the hotbed of sort of Christian activity. Uh, I always like to sort of use this passage from the Psalms in Middle Persian. Uh, uh, by the river banks of Babylon there we sat and we cried when we remembered Zion. Uh, what is fascinating about this translation from Syriac into Middle Persian is that in terms of the history of Middle Persian literature, the earliest specimens of Middle Persian literature outside of inscriptions are actually Christian Middle Persian texts, not Zoroastrian Middle Persian texts. And that's quite fascinating. And it's, there are these translations from Syriac, so they seem to have been either bi certain bilingual, and there's a discussion whether these were actually uh, Syriac uh, translators or uh, Iranians who knew Syriac, uh, that uh, goes back and forth. Uh, the dating is to the late 4th, early 5th century. Here's some Christian seals. The middle one is uh, an example of what Yazgerd has done, uh, will bring about, the seal of Catholicos in what is now Republic of, Arme uh, Republic of Azerbaijan and Armenia in Middle Persian. Uh, he's the Catholicos of Balasagon and that region. Uh, on the left you have another Christian, on the right you have a lady, Miss Mehr Bouzid. And the reason we can tell they're Christian is because they have actually some symbol that suggests the cross tells us. And you had seals if you engage in some business, if you had an official capacity. So these are not people that are landless or without property. They're engaging in daily life. And again, this is important because if you put sort of the world of late antiquity in perspective, uh, I should let you know that after the fifth century in the Roman Empire, for example, except Christians, others had no legal binding. They had no legal status. Christianity had become the religion and others were not. They had no legal rights, okay? If you were a Jew living in uh, Byzantium. Uh, until uh, for a long time. Uh, in Iran, we seem to have a sort of a reverse, this ambivalence ideas and then uh, bringing into fold the Jewish and the Christian community. And by the sixth century, this idea is crystallized in and it's become legalistic. And this is the law of the king, what is known in Persian as Dod. And uh, it's no wonder, here's our uh, Anushiravan, uh, King Khosrani uh, Shiravan, who has taken the title or the epitaph of Dodgar, lawgiver. And in fact, uh, it's not a figment of imagination. This is not propaganda by the Pahlavi regime, but rather records uh, of much early, late antique world where the, this king was equated with lawfulness and legal matters uh, above all. And in fact, from this time, we find now a set of terminology that is not uh, associated based on religion, but rather who is loyal to the state. And the Jews and Christians, I would contend, that are part of it. So you find uh, Mard or Zan, man or woman, Mard Zan is Shah, the man or woman of the empire. 
Shohanshah Bandak, the servant of the king of kings. Here, Bandak, uh, in English, sometimes it doesn't carry its terminology. All the way from Old Persian with Darius in his uh, basin inscription, says, I have a badaka, uh, so-and-so that I sent. He didn't send a slave. Uh, this means someone who's bond to you, a bondsman, someone who's, it has that sense. But in Greek, when it's translated, it completely sort of gives it a sort of an awkward meaning. Dehigane uh, Shahanshah, the subjects of the king of kings, and Shahanshah Bandegi, servants of the king of kings. These are the legal terminologies now that are used for people, regardless of their religious affiliation. And so what we're beginning to see is that Iranians are not only Zoroastrians, but they're people who acknowledge the law of the king. That is, as long as you abide by the king's law, you're protected. Okay? Uh, and that is this legal, uh, legalistic view of what an Iranian is or Iran Shah. Uh, I just want to get through two more interesting sort of uh, tidbits here for you. Uh, in terms of uh, legal offices, there's an interesting office established in the 6th century. Uh, protector of the poor and the judge. Uh, offices are made throughout the empire to go and protect the poor. Uh, in pious foundations are made, actually, uh, to pay for the poor. Driyushan is the same uh, term, uh, Darvish. Uh, Middle Persian Darvish, or Avastan uh, Driyush. Uh, the mendicant poor, uh, and uh, this office with the seal of these people are actually uh, placed throughout the empire. These are the remnants of these ideas of Iran Shah that I think exists and survives in the Islamic period, that we think that suddenly it has come about. It's already there. Uh, for example, the idea of uh, making pious foundations, uh, creating uh, soup, giving uh, thick soup, or having soup kitchens. Having um, a building projects, what we call in Islamic terminology waqf as well, uh, these endowments are all there in legal uh, uh, terminology and in legal texts associated with the late Sasanian Empire. Okay? And I would contend that it's not only the Zoroastrians who are doing this, but also Christians as well as Jews. Uh, there is a nice book by uh, Richard Payne that has also come out this year. I'm not sure if he mentions in this book on the state of mixture on Christians in the Sasanian Empire, but there is somewhere, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that we find today many um, uh, Imams of this. And there's a discussion of what is the antiquity of this. Uh, one contention is, of course, the Christians had many martyrs and many shrines. And many of these may have been just simply Christian shrines that were converted into Islamic shrines. Okay? <clears throat> and that seems, uh, there's some interest and some evidence to that. Uh, but again, it's something that needs to be worked at very much. In terms of pilgrimage, you find, as you find pilgrimage in the Zoroastrian world, and this is Adur Goshnasp, uh, she's the sacred fire temple for the king and the, uh, sort of one of the classes where people went and made pilgrimage as well as the king. Uh, you had other fire temples for other groups of people, uh, but we would have the same thing, type of pilgrimage among the Christians as well as Jews. Uh, it, it, it seems, at least in the late Sasanian period, that all three are in some way doing the same thing. There is, inter, there is communal violence or intercommunal violence once in a while, but it is not in the way that we think that is uh, uh, the, the level of violence is not as such as, let's say, in the fourth century. So, okay, so there is an Iran Shah, uh, there are these people. Um, what is it to be Iranian? And the Sasanians actually tried to create not only a landmass, but also an ideology attached to it. So what is it to be Iri, to have sort of this Ir Meneshni, to have this sort of Iranian trait? And we can glance through certain texts to get some sense. We usually know this very well with the Greek world, right? They went to gymnasiums, they, the, the idea of acquiring paideia in Greek, knowledge. Uh, what its Persian equivalent, Middle Persian, would be frahang or farhang. It was gained in a specific way in the Iranian world. And that you can see uh, from several texts, Khosro and the page. Uh, there's a nice manual that I'm trying to translate, a small manual on children, 
on the behavior of children, what children should do. We usually uh, complain that, you know, the Arabs came and burnt all of our texts and we have nothing left. Well, there are about a couple of hundred texts that half of them haven't been translated. So I hope first we translate these to get a better idea of what was going on and then sort of lament. That is first do something and then lament. Uh, then there's a book of Dita Vardish, which is a common text. And in all of these texts, among others, you find ideas of Farhang knowledge and the way to acquire it by going to a Farhangistan, a uh, place of education, to become Farhichtak, to become knowledgeable. So some of these ideas. So look, what else? Well, if you were to acquire knowledge in late antique Iran and you went to a Farhangistan, you had to learn uh, this is sort of straight out of Middle Persian text. Good handwriting, and as you can see, the Persian has been garbled because I use a PC and this is a Mac. So I apologize, but you could read English. Uh, good handwriting, speed writing, calligraphy, sharp mind, and to have good speech. These were some of the things that you were trained in. Uh, the, uh, uh, again, when I went to school in Iran, I had to do calligraphy, unfortunately, and it was terrible. But apparently kids in the 6th century had to do the same thing. Uh, to learn speed writing is a difficult one to have a good handwriting to do calligraphy and to be trained in a sort of to be sharp mind and I'm going to tell you how you gain that sharp mind and to have good speech to be able to speak well. Well, uh, first let me get back to this manual for children which I'm translating which I really like and no one since at least 1912 has bothered to really look at this seriously. I, I just am astounded of you know uh, in Iran, there are lots of people who work with this. It's a Middle Persian school kind of a book that was translated in 1912 in German by Heinrich Juncker. Uh, and he looked at all, all the sort of uh, um, manuscripts. Uh, if you are <coughs> younger, the top uh, section would be good. In school, Dabiristan. So the term for sort of a lower school is a Dabiristan. Uh, in school, you use your ear, heart, tongue to acquire culture, family, so that when you leave school, you would choose the wise path and through culture. I mean, it's a, a bit more involved text. I've just sort of taken a, a section which has to do with Farhang. And that's why you go to a school. Now, if you're a bit older, going beyond your sort of childhood, when you go to school, when you go to religious school, Herbedistan, go straight. Do not hit and harm dogs, birds, and cattle. I think this very much serves during my <laughs> lifetime, and I think even today. Uh, furthermore, as you're uh, older, if you're not able to go to school, Davidas, uh, in the morning, attend at night to your teacher, Austad, or Avistad in Middle Persian, which you get Ostad. So if you can, if you're working in the morning with your parents on the field or what, you go to night school. Okay, so we had night school. This is one more thing that Iranians can gloat about. We had night school before the Americans put this sort of night school for it. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and uh, sort of the end passage of this text is quite interesting. When you reach the age of 20, go before the savants, the Hirbadan and the Dasturan, the teacher. They will ask you about knowledge. If you are not able to answer, that is if you go to your final exam probably and you fail it, the question, People will look at you. Everybody is going to stare at you. And you will look at the ground. You should sort of be very much embarrassed and not. Uh, so that. These are these ideas, and you could see it's a more detailed, these double texts for children and sort of the youth. Quite interesting on how someone should behave. And so they're behaving properly uh, in the late uh, ancient Iranian world that nobody talks about as far as I'm concerned. Nobody talks about these texts, and they're just there. In terms of religious historical texts, uh, um, the Khosra on the page also states that you should know your past, history. You should know history. I'm a history teacher, so I will emphasize that. You should know your past. Uh, what is interesting is that uh, we think the time that the Avesta as a text, okay, not that it wasn't there, is written down, and the time that uh, the sacred narrative of Iran's past is put down are both in the Sasanian period and the 4th and 6th century. They're only a century apart from each other. And obviously, we think the Avesta 
as a late antique text impacted the national epic, if you want to call it, the Chodainamic. It cannot be. And if you look at Sasanian history in late uh, Sasanian period, you see that some of these kings are very much in acting like these epic heroes, like the Kianyans. They're actually playing a part. They've become almost, it's almost like a show uh, that they're partaking. And that's the impact of uh, this sacred narrative that we find. And so you should know, once uh, this is, uh, text is put to writing, you should know your history. And so we know there was a Chodai Namag, which doesn't survive. And the Shahnameh is not exactly the Chodai I do not want to make that connection. Chodai Namag recensions uh, is a more tricky subject, but certainly uh, the world view to some extent, and sort of the, the view of the past is in sync with the Shahnameh. But Shahnameh, of course, is an epic. It is um, Islamicized. It's sort of been defanged of its Zoroastrian ideas to some extent. And so we must not just automatically jump to Khodai Namak from the Shah. And so, but uh, we get this tradition of sort of tripartite history of the lawgivers, the Paradatas of the Pishtagi, and the Kian and the heroic age, and then crash landing into history of Darius and Alexander. And it just jumps to Sasanians, which is the majority of the text of this historical site. And so that is, uh, to, in some way or form, was taught and people learned. And this view of history was quite important not only in the Iranian world, but far beyond it and after the fall of the Sasanian dynasty. I will give you an example. Um, almost, not all, early Islamic dynasties in the East from the time of Mahmud, 830, what is it, 813, 833 or something like that, uh, early 9th century, begin to create a genealogy for themselves. Now, true or not, that's not my uh, point here, but they all connect themselves to heroes or kings or some figure associated with the ancient Iranian dynasties, right? Uh, and that is quite interesting. And even the Seljuks, the Seljuks of Rome, who have gone on the border, these are jihadi sort of states, not in the same, well, they're jihadi, I'm sorry. I'm going to get questioned probably in the airport. They're jihadis, uh, they're conducting jihad on the Byzantine territory in the 12th and 13th century. And these Seljuks of Rome, uh, what names are they using? Keikavus, Kehosro. There's a, and they're commissioning Shahnamas. It's very interesting. Now, I don't want to read too much into this, but my alternative suggestion beside this jihadi nature is that they're still reenacting the Sasanian idea that the world should be united. It was tripartite uh, between Turan, Iran, and uh, uh, Rome. They've got two of it. This should be united. And I think some of that ideology may have played into this. There's one Turkic dynasty. The other Turkic dynasties very much are playing into this. Are the Barakhanids. Are way into what is Samarapan, um, what we call Central Asia, Greater Khorasan. The Karakhanids are Turkic nobility. They're not buying into this Rostam and Khosro and Ushirabhan. No, none of these kings. They are Turkic bred nobility. So who do they connect themselves to? Afrasia. Who's Afrasia? Afrasia is a mythical character, if you want to call it others want to call it a historical character that is apparent only in the Iranian national epic. That is, if you even want to not be part of this national heroes and be outside of it, you still have to use the characters from this epic and this history. This is the power of this text, uh, not only in late antiquity, but in the medieval times. They have to go reach into the Chodai Nameh, traditional Shah Nameh, oh, Afrasia, yeah, that was the Turks, so the, and so we're related to it. That is the power of a text. Okay. And uh, some of the more religious uh, sort of ideas associated with being Iranian and that you find in Zoroastrianism is the idea of being righteous. And more importantly, something that I always like to tell every time I give a lecture, there's this concept in Middle Persian called Paiman, mean sort of uh, balance. The idea of being radical is something uh, distasteful to the Zoroastrian tradition. 
the Iranians who very much like to talk about their you know, truths or ask around their true Iranian, it's very good to take some uh, word of advice from the ancient texts to be balanced, to not be sort of radical on this side or that side, but rather sort of take the middle ground. And there's much text on this as to why you should do this and why you should do this. Uh, in terms of, so these are some sort of intellectual, mental ideas. Uh, there are also games that are used for training, and I'll go through rapidly and we'll be done. Uh, in terms of mental game, uh, we know that chess and uh, the game of chess came to Europe via the Muslims in the ninth century. Of course, uh, the earliest uh, manual on the game of chess is a Middle Persian text that we can maybe uh, date it to the sixth century, to the time of Khosrow and Shiraba. Uh, and um, it's a game of strategy, wisdom, life. Uh, it's a Middle Persian text. Again, I'm advertising for myself. Dr. Milani has one of it. I've translated the text again more recently with sort of copious notes of this Middle Persian text, which tell us lots about ideology, worldview, and what the Sasanians were trying to propagate. Now, in terms of physical readiness, just as in the Greek world, where you have to be ready mentally and physically in the Iranian world, you had the same thing. Uh, we know that in Europe, uh, there's evidence of jousting from the ninth century. Again, interesting. But it's important to know that the idea of nezagvari in Middle Persian uh, already exists in the fourth century. Now, this may be a battle scene, and that may be Mr. Hormiz, the brother who ended up going to Byzantium and uh, he became known as Hormiz Das. Uh, and his letters are just being translated. Uh, very fascinating. He was sort of the brother of king who actually went to uh, the Byzantine uh, Empire. Uh, uh, something to be to write on. These sort of uh, these uh, contenders to the throne who leave their empire and they go as uh, princes to be crowned in the enemy camp. But we find evidence of jousting. Uh, other games. The earliest reference to the game of polo. Again, from late antique Iran. Chobigan, where we find that is another game uh, which seems to have been a kingly game. And lastly, the chase. And the reason you go on the chase or the hunt, and here is Mr. Bahram again being shown hunting, and there is another Sasanian dish, uh, is to uh, be ready in the off season. It's as opposed to the season for warfare. In order to be ready, uh, you want to practice, you go on the hunt in the off season. And that's uh, you might say it's a form of sport that maybe not so much kindly looked upon today, but in late antiquity, that is the way to keep uh, yourself in form and in shape. <clears throat> so these were some of the notions and ideas that were associated if you were Iranian and belonged to this Iranian world that you should keep in mind, that you should learn by going to school and through religious training. Uh, but the way, again, that this empire held together, remember, there are many different religious groups, there are many different speaking people, was uh, the, the charisma of the king, the water of the king, was quite important, and the relation of the king to these different groups held this sort of, uh, a, you might say, uh, a very sort of diverse group of people with different religions and languages, under this idea of Iran or Iran Shah. And I think that is something quite important. Uh, and uh, it goes beyond uh, the Sasanian period. I just want to show you this. I forgot that there's this not only a mental idea of what Iranian is, but also a physical space. Uh, recently, there have been more uh, excavations at the Wall of Gorgon. Uh, I think Sour. Yes, Professor Stranek? Sour, I think, has been excavating. Um, up there, uh, which is the longest sort of continuous wall in late antiquity, uh, in, the, in, in the ancient world, uh, from the Caspian all the way to the east, where it created actually a physical and a mental boundary of inside, civilization, these ideas of Iranians that outside, the wilderness, and, you know, uh, the people that should be kept out. And I think a conference on walls is quite important, especially today, from the wall that the president wants to make in Mexico uh, to the Berlin Wall, 
uh, to the wall to keep the Huns and others outside of the Iranian Empire, to the Chinese wall, to the Hadrian wall, and so on. To the gated communities, which I live very much close to as well, which have their own walls. All of these, of course, is to keep others outside. Now, if you don't believe me <coughs> that these Sasanians thought that, in fact, they, were, they had a wall and they had some sort of a nice thing going inside, I sort of take a passage from um, Khosran Shiravan's words of wisdom uh, to his people. Iran is a lush garden where the roses ever bloom. The army and weapons that are the garden's walls. Hmm, interesting walls. And Lance is its wall of thorns. If the garden's walls are pulled down, then there will be no difference between it and the wilderness beyond. So again, this inside, outside, civilization, law, everything good in. Take care not to destroy its walls and not to dishearten or weaken Iranians. If you do, then raiding and pillaging will follow. And also the battle cries of riders and the din of war risk not the safety of the Iranians' wives, children, and lands by bad policies and plans. A nice sort of words of wisdom uh, associated to Khosrow and Shiravan. Of course, Shahnama is a much later text, uh, but there may be a kernel of truth to that in terms of these speeches. Uh, this idea of Iran Shah survives the Sasanians. I would contend if it was an idea that was only associated with a specific religious tradition, it would have withered away. And an evidence to this is a Middle Persian text from a gentleman by the name of Hormizd Afri, who was Christian. He went to Constantinople in the 9th century. 9th century is when the Abbasids are ruling <coughs> from Baghdad. One goes to um, Constantinople to study Christianity and dies there. On his coffin, there's an inscription. The inscription reads, from the dwelling of Iran Shah in the ninth century, a Christian from the district of Chalagan, from the village of Khisht. This inscription itself tells us that the Sasanians had successfully transferred the idea of a place called Iran Shah and a concept with it beyond any specific religious idea uh, but rather uh, an idea that others from different religions could acknowledge, be part of. And even after that downfall of this empire, people still stuck to its idea. And I would say in some ways uh, that needs to be studied more throughout the Middle Ages and the modern times, this idea has resonated. Thank you.